I'll move to members' statements. I recognize the member for Whitby. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker. Last Friday, I attended the second annual Accessibility Awards ceremony at the Ability Centre in Whitby. And the winners this year were Luca DeMontis, Trevor Smith, Alison Hector Alexander, Julie Grant, and Lauren McDonald. Speaker, each of the award recipients have demonstrated their dedication to making communities more accessible and inclusive and to ensuring that everyone, regardless of ability, has a chance to live happy lives of purpose and dignity. Through its innovative initiatives, the Ability Centre has become a beacon of hope and progress, empowering individuals of all abilities to thrive. Over the last two years, our government has provided $8 million in support of the Ability Centre. The staff at the centre provide important supports for our loved ones in Whitby who have varying levels of ability and is an excellent example of how a local facility can help create a strong community of inclusion. Speaker, our government is committed to building an Ontario where individuals with varying ability have the opportunity to fully engage in their communities and, Speaker, live the lives they choose. Thank you. Member statements. I recognize the member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. Last month, I held a meeting where I informed my community about fraud and the abuse of a type of lien against the property called a Notice of Security Interest, or NOSI for short. As you know, people across our province, especially seniors and vulnerable members of our communities, have been victimized by unscrupulous door-to-door -door salespeople who have used every trick in the book to try and scam them into a bad contract. Many of these scams involve nosies without the knowledge of the victim. So these liens sit unnoticed until the time comes to sell, take out a loan, or refinance your home. During this stressful time, the victims are extorted to pay large amounts to have the lien removed or spend loads of time and money in the courts trying to reverse this vexatious registration. These liens are often in the tens of thousands, and Speaker, a family in my riding had over a dozen nosies placed on their home. A dozen. In many cases, the personal banking and identification of these victims are trafficked and used to commit other types of fraud. In extreme cases, the victims are tricked into signing reverse mortgages in an attempt for the thieves to steal their homes. At my town hall, residents couldn't believe that the government hadn't put an end to this yet. I let my residents know about our private member's bill to ban nosies, and they all insisted that it be passed immediately. So, Speaker, once again, I call on this government to ban nosies in Ontario and to notify all Ontarians who have a nosy on their property free of charge. Thank you. For the member's statements, I recognize the member for Carleton. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, Rudra Prince was like any other happy eight-year-old boy, but one thing made him different. He had asthma. In 2018, Rudra was having a severe asthma attack. His mother, Rumi, called 911. Rudra looked at her and said, Mummy, I can't breathe. I'm going to die. Rudro died in a coma two weeks later. Since that tragic day, Hassan and Rumi Prince have devoted their lives to raising awareness to the severity of asthma, and they say our hardworking and tireless respiratory educators and first responders need more support. Each year in Ottawa, they host the Rudro Prince Walk to raise money for Asthma Canada, Chio, and St. Mary Elementary School. This year, will be the sixth year of the Rudro Prince Memorial Walk on Sunday, September 29, and I look forward to joining, along with many people in the community, as well as our first responders. Every day, Hassan and Rumi fight through their pain to focus on the legacy they have created for their son. No matter how dark the skies are in their world, they have never given up hope. Hope that the legacy they created for Rudro can help save the lives of others. Today is World Asthma Awareness Day. Today on World Asthma Day, I recognize Asthma Canada, marking their 50th anniversary, working towards their mission to enhance the quality of life for Canadians with asthma and empower them to live active, symptom-free lives. It is a day to remember Rudro and other victims of this disease, and it's a day for us to learn and be more aware of the severity of asthma. Thank you. You're here. Good statement. For the member statements, I recognize the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. Today I rise to honour Gary Parent. He's tough and he's kind, he's honest, and he has always been on the side of not just working people, but everyone in Windsor. For 57 years, he's been married to the love of his life, Arden. He has two children, Jason and Jennifer, two granddaughters, Emma and Dana, and sister Darlene. 
A uniformed member, formerly CAW, he worked at Chrysler, was elected in 1967 as a steward, wanting to follow fellow, fellow labour giant Charlie Brooks's vision. In 1982, he became president of Labour Council, and in 87, he was elected financial secretary of 444, serving in that position until his retirement. Gary served in labour roles for 26 years, but his service to community extends well beyond that. Gary's belief that public services should be built on and strengthened for the betterment of everyone has never wavered, and his contributions to my community is why we have the Gary Parent Labour Activist Award every year. His belief in me is a driving factor of why I am here today as the MPP for Windsor West. Gary is facing declining health and is in palliative care. He asked me to share this message. Quote, I have to say how amazing I feel. My children and grandchildren all went into a job in public service. Public services matter. Please, let's all come together, be better, and do better. We must fight to protect our public services. Representing union members in our community was what I wanted to do. Little did I know I was a mentor. I just wanted the best for everyone." End quote. Thank you, Gary, for everything you have done. We love you, brother. Sorry, I apologize. I recognize Member Chatham Kent. Hi, good morning, and thank you, Speaker. On Tuesday, April 30th, I was so proud to tour Victor Lauriston Public School in Chatham to observe their initiatives and elementary students in classroom STEM learning, literacy, and coding. Every classroom from senior kindergarten to grade eight. Principal Aaron Smith and his staff are fully committed to ensuring all students have a strong focus on the study of science, technology, engineering, and math, including cross-curricular and integrative study and the application of those subjects in real-world contexts. Victor Lorison School was built in 1948 in a neatly situated urban Chatham neighborhood with a school population of around 380 students. The school is maintained immaculately and boasts high morale, low employee turnover, and high staff seniority, with several staff having been students themselves. I was thrilled to see senior kindergarten students in action participating in applied coding exercises and grade five and six students using special invention kits, also known as Makey Makeys, with circuit boards, alligator clips, and USB cables to create a closed loop electrical signal to literally create music and phrases from hand drawings. Most inspiring was the school's nutrition program led by parent volunteers that provides every student with fresh, healthy food offerings every day, like the expansive salad bar I helped to serve. Thank you to Principal Smith and everyone at Victor Lauriston School for your commitment to, ad, to excellence. Go Lions! Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, nearly 4,000 pages of do documents we released yesterday paint a very disturbing picture of backroom dealing and preferential treatment at the highest levels of the Ford government. The records provide clear proof that Ford officials went to great lengths to conceal their true motives of removing precious Greenbelt land to benefit wealthy speculators and developers. We see the Premier's own office director being looped into meetings with developers whose lands were conveniently opened up. Text messages reveal misleading public statements as ministry staff worked secretly to strip away environmental protections. And incredibly, just days after a developer attended the Premier's daughter's wedding, the same developer's proposal to pave over the green, green belt was prioritized. So let's be honest. This was never about the housing crisis, and it certainly wasn't about the well-being of the public. These bombshell documents tell the real story, one of corporate favoritism, conflicts of interest, and a government putting sprawl developers first at the expense of farmland, at, at the expense of our green spaces, and certainly at the expense of future generations, and at the expense of faith in democracy and good government. There's an old adage that a democracy has to be more than two wolves and a sheep voting on what to have for dinner. But that's what this Greenbelt scheme reveals. It reeks, and it's the worst kind of cynical cronyism that makes people lose faith in governments and, frankly, in basic decency. 
This is another broken promise and more rock-solid proof that this government will always put their insiders ahead of the interests of the people of Ontario. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Good morning. Today is World Asthma Day, an important reflection on the profound impact of asthma on our communities, particularly here in Ontario, where millions grapple with this chronic inflammatory disease. A staggering 4.6 million Canadians live with asthma, making it the third most common chronic disease in our country. Asthma narrows bronchial tubes, leading to restricted airflow and difficulty to breathe. It's a leading cause of emergency department visits and absenteeism from school and work. Speaker, when I work in the ER, asthma exacerbation is a common chief complaint for the patients I care for, especially our little ones, the children. Speaker, there is nothing worse than not being able to breathe. And while some patients face severe limitations, for most, proper diagnosis and treatment can effectively manage the condition. I would also like to highlight that this year marks the 50th anniversary of Asthma Canada, with many representatives with us here today. This organization has been a beacon of hope, support and advocacy, empowering Canadians with asthma to lead active, symptom-free lives through education, research and advocacy. Looking ahead, Asthma Canada and the Ontario government share a vision for improved asthma care. We are committed to a future where research thrives, awareness is heightened, and healthcare is pro proactive. That is why earlier this year, our government expanded the scope of practice for pharmacists, enabling them to treat and prescribe asthma medications. So today, as we, as we commemorate this day, let's reaffirm our commitment to supporting those affected by asthma, working hand-in-hand -hand with great organizations like Asthma Canada. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Speaker. Last week I visited farmers in Wilmot Township and learned about how the government tried to hoodwink them. After the Premier ordered land to be assembled for industrial use and non-disclosure agreements were signed by local officials, the Region of Waterloo made offers to farmers in Wilmot Township north of Bleams Road. One such offer was $4.3 million for 85 acres, or about $51,000 an acre. I have a photo of the written offer. Subsequently, a neighbouring farmer had his land appraised as if it were unserviced industrial land. Value, $680,000 an acre, more than 10 times what was offered by the region of Waterloo. This attempt to swindle farmers and buy their land for a song through an opaque process reminds me of the great $8 billion Greenbelt giveaway that spawned the ongoing RCMP criminal investigation. When will it stop? When will this government care about farmers and preserving our remaining prime agricultural land and care about transparency instead of looking for places to refill its gravy train? Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Brampton North. Uh, <clears throat> Speaker, Brampton is fortunate. We're a diverse city, we're a growing city, and we are a young city. Perhaps our biggest asset is our talent pool. There's a new generation of Brampton residents that are leading the country and the world when it comes to business, athletics, music, culture, and innovation. We're lucky to have a growing post-secondary sector, including Algoma University, who operates in downtown Brampton and educates thousands of students every year. But one of the challenges Algoma faces, because they're growing so quickly, is a lack of housing options for their students. We have too many students in Brampton who are living in subpar living conditions, conditions that no member of this house would consider acceptable for one of their family members. Well, Speaker, I'm happy to announce that right now, while I speak in this legislature, Algoma, Algoma University is in downtown Brampton announcing a brand new 500 plus bed student resident expected open doors by 2028-29. This new student residence will include over 500 beds in a mix of single and double bedrooms and four to six bed suites, with each suite including two bathrooms, a kitchen and a living space. Speaker. Thanks to the policy changes that this government has introduced, it's likely that construction will be expedited. Getting shovels on the ground, supporting our next generation is a priority for the people of Brampton, it is a priority for this government, 
and I commend Algoma U for making it their priority as well. Thank you very much. Member Statements. The member for Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. Recently, the good people of Cambridge gathered to celebrate another successful United Way campaign. The sixth annual Spirit Awards ceremony was an opportunity to celebrate um, the 2023 United Way Award, which raised $5 million to be shared among more than 90 local charities and nonprofit organizations. Those organizations assist nearly a quarter million individuals and families in need across Waterloo Region. The evening was an opportunity to celebrate with individuals and businesses in the regions who work to support our most vulnerable and marginalized residents. Spirit Awards were presented in seven categories. Nutrition for Learning was awarded to the Community Impact Award. Sandy Young was named Volunteer of the Year. The Spirit of Community Award went to Reliance Home Comfort. The Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario won the Labour Community Partnership Award. Outstanding Workplace uh, Campaign Award went to Toyota Mo Motor Manufacturing. Last but not least, the Ken Sealing Community Leaders Award was presented to a very deserving individual, John Newfeld, Executive Director of the House of Friendship. This award recognizes a public figure, and John is definitely that person. Thank you to United Way CEO, uh, Joan Fisk for her team for coming up with to aid for all our community groups this year, year after year after year. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our member statements for this morning.